Um, just as a start, I'm putting a disclaimer out there that um, this, partner, this project involves a lot of people representing a lot of organizations. And if I have failed to mention a particular person or organization, it's not deliberate. Um, so please don't rush out there and try and beat me up afterwards. Um, I'm trying to acknowledge everybody that is involved, but I'm just putting that disclaimer out there in the beginning. I think we all understand the importance of partnerships in conservation. Um, resources are always tight, skills are tight and stuff. And this is one particular project where I think we see the, the value and importance of partnerships being put into practice. And hopefully through the course of this presentation that will come, become quite clear and potentially some new partners being identified that can contribute to our dwindling or vulture um, populations that are under threat um, in Zululand. Just to, to start off, we've got to ask ourselves, well, what is a partnership? Some of us may see it mainly in the, in the corporate field where people come together in, in the business sector to, to make money. Others see um, marriage as a form of partnership, and we see how often those fail. So I kind of went and said, well, what is a partnership? And basically it's defined as the state of being between persons or bodies with a joint interest or association. And I kind of want to emphasize a joint interest. Because people, if you want to succeed in a partnership, you have to have that interest. And so, uh, coming out of that, the outcome should be more effective than if a single party works alone. Um, there's risks and benefits for all parties, as opposed to a relationship where one party normally benefits more than the other. So, there's an equal distribution of risks and benefits to all the parties involved. But for conservation, partnerships, the ultimate benefit, beneficiary should be biodiversity. And that's, that's the gauge that we should be using as to whether or not a partnership is successful. Not about how much funding one particular organization can get or exposure in the press, but what is that partnership doing for biodiversity? And that's what we've got to keep in the back of our minds. That is the, critic, the crux of the matter in terms of partnerships for biodiversity. And then many have evolved as a result of the scope of the work and the resources required to achieve such. So finance, people, vehicles, and that's where a lot of partnerships have developed within the conservation arena. So why would we want a partnership? Obviously there's benefits. You can combine complementary skills to achieve more. So with what little that we do have, we can do more. And that's one of the benefits of a partnership. The second is the access to the local knowledge and experience. Especially where you start heading out into new territories, where you don't know a lot, you don't know where all the birds particular are, so you want to partner with people that can assist with that. Capacity building, we've all seen that. We all need capacity built within our organizations, within municipalities. So that's one of the benefits of partnerships. And then there's also local acceptance and legitimacy to your work. And that's something we've always got to keep in mind, that people on the ground need to accept what you're doing, and it's got to be a legitimate issue. Because at the end of the day, especially when people are putting money into these projects, they want to know that there's the backing of everybody involved. But coming with benefits, there's always going to be risks. One, you are going to strain your existing resources when you get involved. Um, there's going to be a failure to meet commitments, and I think that's something that we all uh, grapple with, is that people commit to something. Um, people higher up on the food chain change their decisions. They change people's job descriptions, and then there's a failure to meet those commitments, and that's one of the risks. Um, or your funding dries up and then you don't know how you're going to continue in the partnership. Differing priorities. People come with good intentions, the priorities change within the workplace, and then they battle to meet those commitments. And then the one I think that we all can uh, associate with is changes in personnel. And often you have enthusiastic people in the beginning, they get transferred, they pass on, or whatever, and the next person comes in with a totally different agenda. They might, in this case, might not like vultures. They might be thinking about some other bird or mammal species. And suddenly, there's a danger of those partnerships falling apart. So moving closer to home and to the actual project itself, just to give you a little bit of history, the, the Zululand Vulture Project basically started um, in about 2004 with um, the initiation of a ringing program. And that's really where it started is, um, the late James Wakelin saw the need to, to look at a dwindling number of vulture populations, what was happening, where they were going, and initiated a, a color ringing program. Um, and that's where this project has basically started. And it was driven by passionate individuals. Guys, um, section rangers in Mkuzi and Zululand got involved. And they were passionate about wanting to do more for vultures. 
And that's how this program has morphed into what we know today. And slowly, pe more people have got, got involved, more organizations, and they've led to a number of activities being undertaken. So what was originally were just a coloring program has evolved into um, a whole lot more. Um, obviously, things that we're un undertaking today is the implementation of approved monitoring plans. KZN Wildlife is the, the authority in the province have developed and are implementing a number of uh, vulture monitoring uh, plans and that's what this uh, project is then responsible for making sure that that's been undertaken it's also the undertaking of an aerial survey um, they still continuing with the ringing the tagging and tracking um, recitings information education awareness and then obviously law enforcement and I'll break these down as I go through the presentation so the first one and then just basically who's involved, and this is where the disclaimer is really important. If I've left anybody out, I apologize again. But the main key role players are obviously KZN Wildlife, the Endangered Wildlife Trust, Wildlife Act, ESKIM, private landowners, and Raptor Rescue. And those are, I think, people that have been involved the longest um, and are still involved today. So basically, it all starts off with the Vomit Comet. Um, and this is the start of the aerial surveys and, and the importance of partnerships here because anybody that will know that's done an aerial survey, it, not anybody can get in an aeroplane. You might think you can and it's very different to the Boeings and the Airbuses that you take off at King Sharker. <laughs> and many people will attest to filling up little brown paper bags with Greg Nanny. And, um, and myself included, for six years I did crane counts and I thought I was invincible and I got brought horribly to ground with a big thud and a very full bag. And since then, I can't get back in this, in, in this plane. And so some people can. John Craigie has a, a stomach of steel. He can eat sandwiches while the person next to him is green behind the gills. So that's one of the values of a partnership is not everybody can get in an aeroplane. And I think that's what's so important is some people can, others can't. So and just to give you kind of say, well, how, how terrible can it be? But just to give you some idea, um, you can see these are our flight paths of some of our protected areas, and you can see a lot of circles. And that plane goes round and round and round and round. And when you just think you can't, you go round again, because you really want to make sure that you've identified the right species, what's happening in that nest and stuff. And in that little small cockpit, it's hot. It gets hot in Zululand. You're not flying over the Midlands where it's cool. It can become very unpleasant and that's where you need people with some strong subjects so part of our aerial surveys we not only fly within our protected areas but we also fly um, on some of the privately owned land but i just wanted to give you an example we try to be comprehensive as possible to make sure that we we record all the nests exactly what's happening and that's basically the pictures that you're getting bird on the nest recording is there a chick no chick are the eggs incubating chick fledged and so there's a set parameters that you're recording at that particular time and so those are just the three three of the main reserves that we cover pongola and kuzi and hrp and as i said there are other ones but that's just to illustrate exactly what happens during the aerial survey and that's done twice so if you're a sucker for punishment you do it in august and you come again in october just in case you've missed something and then that information that gets translated onto the ground and you've got to do some ground truthing um, and checking what's actually happening as, as well as part of the ringing. And some of it's not for the faint-hearted. Some of it's easy. You just put up a ladder and you climb up a tree. And others, you've got to put the ladder in the tree and then climb up. And, you know, you kind of think it's a ladder, but we must understand this is not a solid brick building that you put the ladder. These are fairly thin acacias and stuff and there's wind and, and they move around. So it's not for the faint-hearted. And then you kind of think, well, okay, so you just climb up and you grab the chick out the nest. But then you get there and you can't even get to the nest. And you've got to try to find a way to, and as I said, it's an acacia. It's not a little eucalypt. You just slither through the branches and stuff. So it's definitely not for the faint-hearted. And I think there's many that can attest to look peering over the nest and birds getting sick on you um, or getting stuck in the tree itself, trying to get the bird down. And so it, it just... There's a special kind of person that's needed to actually do this work. Not everybody's just going to scale up a ladder, grab a bird, come back down, or check what's in the nest and stuff. But depending where you are, it does get a little bit easier. And the guys obviously further north in Zululand are a little bit softer. They get make use of a cherry picker. You just push a button and it goes up and you look <laughs> over the nest. You don't get stuck. The tree doesn't move. 
Um, and that's where we've been very uh, grateful to one of our, our partners, Eskim. Every year, there's a cherry picker. Um, and even when it gets damaged, driving over rocks, putting holes in the sump, uh, punctures, they come back every year and say, don't worry, we will provide you with a vehicle. And it, it definitely makes life a whole lot easier. And then with the advent of technology, you put a little GoPro on the camera here, you don't have to climb anymore. Uh, this is actually a link stick that um, Eskim have also provided, a link stick of those things that they check and mark power lines with. So you can then basically just put that up, check into the nest and stuff like that. So there's various ways that the partners are getting together and just making our life a little bit easier. I won't mention that possibly that the three chaps down at the bottom are actually too scared to climb. So they're quite happy <laughs> to make use of <laughs> Okay, then moving on along and then we move into the next phase of what uh, we, we're doing is you're bringing the chicks down and then you put in uh, the, the, the color tags onto the wings. Uh, and, and the satellite tracking, which is all adding to the valuable information of the species. And that's where you start looking at um, the, the skills transfer. And one of the importance of partnerships is we've got guys with many years. We've got Ben Hoffman down here. He's got ample years of, of raptor, handling raptors, that experience. And that's the skills transfer, that the benefit of a partnership. They're transferring skills to... Um, the ecologist in the park and Andre Boerter bringing in that, that ringing experience so that we can then become uh, skilled at that. So what have we done? And this is just a short synopsis of, of color ringing and tagging uh, that's been undertaken um, in HRP, Mkuzi and Pongola, just three of the reserves. Obviously, it also gets done outside that. And then there's the, the little anomaly there, which is Kempenfalt, where we did a mass, a mass capture with a walk-in <laughs> trap just to add to um, the, the tagging of vultures. So you can see in that, that three-year period, we uh, tagged 91 African whitebacks, 22 leopards, and one white-headed. So and what does that give us then? Well, we can see this is just some of the birds that have been recited, and it adds to our understanding of the species. You can see this is at Kempenfalt, the birds that were... Kempenfalt is just outside. It's a vulture restaurant just outside Dundee. And you can see where the birds are moving. Namibia, Botswana right there almost into to Zambia, Zimbabwe, up into the, the Kruger National Park complex. And this is showing the importance of our vulture populations into a regional context. It is no longer just what they do in KZN, they're moving right throughout the region. And not only are they moving regionally, but also within the province, this is now what some of the information coming out of the, the, the satellite tagging. You can see birds uh, that have been tagged in Pongola, moving all the way out to Ladysmith. So this is really no longer just the Zululand Vulture Project. This is like kind of, we've got to start engaging now with people almost in the, our, our partners in the Berg, that Spionkop Nature Reserve, Wienan. Um, so now it means you can't just restrict it to Zululand anymore. You've got to start engaging right across the province because these birds are moving fairly large distances. So why are we doing this? What's the importance if you just look at the species that occur here? You can see th this is a 2004 estimate, and I can tell you it's not going to be any more rosier, the picture, even though that's from 2004. But there you're looking at a rough estimate of the number of breeding pairs, and that's what we're looking at where we want to get to. And we're way below everything in terms of in, in reaching those targets, possibly apart from the palm nut vulture. But everything else, we, we, we're way below what our conservation target is. So that's the first thing what this project's trying to do. We've got to reach a target. The second thing is, as I've demonstrated, is that we're part of a regional population. It's not just birds in KZN. These birds, these juveniles, are dispersing great areas, moving up into the region. And so basically what's happening here and, and what happens here affects the regional population and that fringe benefit. If, all our, popula if our populations go extinct, that's just going to have an impact on the rest of the region's populations. It also complements what is being done elsewhere. And then it's also fulfilling our mandate. Guys, it's not all about the rhino. So we've got an importance here to conserve um, uh, our vulture populations as well. And then going back to what I mentioned about uh, the benefits and risks to partnerships, if we review, are the outcomes more effective than working alone? A resounding yes. KZN Wildlife on its own could not have achieved what's been done today. Um, funding, the resources, just that access into all these area, areas so we've definitely achieved more than one particular partner. Are we combining complementary skills? Yes. The EWT is bringing experience. It's bringing the national perspective. 
to the point that our capacity has been built. The Wildlife Act is bringing funding, personnel, it's bringing a passion, it's bringing exposure to the project. And then to KZN Wildlife, we bring in the birds, they're in our reserves, but we also bring in the staff that are helping that. Capacity building, yes, a resounding yes, we have more trained ringers now. We don't have to rely on external people. We've got, in KZN, we've got trained ringers, people that can handle birds properly, ethically. Is there local acceptance and legitimacy? Yes. The organization has, the, uh, has accepted this project, as well as private landowners. Private landowners are worried about their vulture populations. They're reporting these things. Has biodiversity benefits? And here I've had to put a yes and a no. Because yes, we've got a better understanding of the birds. We know where they're moving. But unfortunately, birds are still being poisoned. And that's one of the issues we've got to grapple with. So where do we go forward from here? Obviously, we've got to continue with the monitoring, the aerial surveys, the tagging, the breeding productivity. That all m helps us to the management of the species. We're registering this project officially with Isamvelo and the Isimangaliso Authority um, just to continue that buy-in and that, that, that acceptance. But poisoning is the biggest threat, and that's where something as a group, as a province, as, as stakeholders that we've got to start addressing because our birds are being poisoned. Two weeks ago, they picked up 50 birds just outside Itala. Sorry? 100. So it's 100. It's, it's scary. This is one of the biggest issues facing our, um, our vultures. The education, there's, the op there's huge opportunities to uh, raise awareness, improve law enforcement within our own organization, with the SAPS, um, the community, and then looking for additional partners. Um, I'm in contact with BirdLife to potentially access some international funding to specifically address the educational component. So we've definitely got a lot of work and, and this partnership's only going to go from strength to strength. Just to make some acknowledgements as I end off here, obviously it's to the staff of all the partners, scientists, conservation managers, field rangers, the admin staff, everybody. I'm not going to mention names because I'll invariably leave somebody else, but a big thank you to everybody that's involved, the private landowners and also the funding institutions. Thank you.